Hello everybody, uh, buenas tardes a todo el mundo, buenos días. Uh, this is the first session, I, the hybrid session after one year and a half or, of online meetings. This is the first way in which some of the people are here in the UP, UPF room and other uh, you are online, so we 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 will uh, we hope that everything will be okay. This session is dedicated to uh, has will will have two parts. The first one uh, will be dedicated to uh, to present the background paper about Chicago in the trans gang project about youth gangs, youth street groups in Southern Europe, Northern Africa, and the Americas um, by uh, William Ross that uh, Nelly will present after my general welcome. Uh, and the second part of the session will be dedicated to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that has arisen uh, in the last uh, year, one year and a half. So. Nelle will, uh, the, the structure of the session will be as uh, normally happen, uh, a first speech, then all the people, including online and offline participants, will have the possibility to ask some questions, comments, and then, uh, then there will be a final remarks by the presenter. So Nelle. So uh, welcome everybody um, to this uh, Transgang se training seminar. As uh, Carlos al already presented the thematic theme, we are really happy that today we are uh, with uh, William Ross, who's our uh, researcher, local researcher in Chicago, researching uh, trans gangs in, in this area in Chicago. So, um, and we hope that uh, a lot of you could connect um, themselves via streaming uh, to the seminar. Um, if you have any questions that uh, you would like to ask uh, William Ross or some comments you would like to make, um, you can write an email to us to transgang at upf.edu. Um, so all the emails we will receive, we can then um, the, the questions we will receive, we can discuss then in the end in the question, in the question round. Um, so, as I said, we are really happy that we can be here today with William Ross. And now I would like to present William Ross. He holds a Bachelor in Business Administration, a Master in Nonprofit Management and Leadership, a PhD in Spiritual Counseling, and currently he is also completing a second PhD in public policy and administration with a specialization in global leadership. He's also a community organizer and educator with over two decades of experience and expertise working with different street organizations. And he's also a member of the Almighty Latin King and Queen Nation for over 25 years. And now we will um, hand over to, uh, to William and his presentation, and he will share with us his information on gangs in, in the Chicago area. So welcome, and uh, Thank you. go ahead, William. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody who's presently here, as well as those of you who are online. Hoping everybody could hear me through the muffling of the mask. If you can't, Raise your hand and I'll gladly take it off and that'll be, that'll be the end of that. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the transnational gang phenomenon that is coming out of Chicago. One of the things that we want to talk about before we actually get into the presentation is that to understand any kind of phenomenon with respect to street organizations, whether it be in Chicago or any other state, you really have to look at the history of the United States as a whole, what is American history, what is immigration history, um, and that's really going to set the stage for how it is you're going to understand what came to be created in Chicago. The other thing is it's important for us as academic researchers, for U.S. students, to always understand the respect that this topic demands. It is imperative that we always remember that we are researching real life 
uh, situations. We are working with real individuals who are living this phenomenon on a day-to-day. -day. A PowerPoint presentation does not do justice to the fact that people are living this in the streets in their homes on a day-to-day -day basis. The very first slide that you see is uh, a memorial, a piece of a memorial that was constructed for Adam Toledo, which was a young Mexican uh, brother. He was a member of the Latin Kings. He was 13 years old and he was shot by the police running away from a chase that the police ensued on him after he was allegedly shooting at other individuals. He ran down an alley. He had no gun on him. Uh, when he turned around, the cops shot him. It would later come out that they did find the gun and they did find a video uh, where he did have a gun on him. However, the point here is uh, this is real life for the young people that we work with. Okay, So this is an example of, of that memorial. <clears throat> it cannot be overstated that those conducting ethnographic research should never forget that the lives they're researching are still being lived. Again, reiterating what I just stated, this project may have started an end date, but its effects on the lives involved will not be limited to grant guidelines or contractual protocols. When we sit with someone who shares their organizational involvement with us, we must be conscious of the biases we bring to the table. As you all do your research, listen to our studies, listen to our findings, and engage in any kind of research on your own, always remember, again, this is real life for so many people. Gang members, uh, street organization members, anyone in the community, they're not lab rats. They're not to be poked at on the glass and see how they move around. This is their life, okay? Researching in Chicago is a very interesting task. This is a community that is plagued by violence, uh, a city that is extremely rich in its position in American culture, but also extremely segregated, okay? Uh, millions of government dollars annually have been invested and continue to be invested in organizations to address the violence in Chicago. However, it remains unaffected. Memorials such as the one that you're seeing here uh, are very, very common in Chicago. Uh, you need only put in a Google search uh, for shootings this past weekend, and you can literally pick any weekend you want, and you're going to find upwards of 30 to 50 shootings per weekend. Okay? This is an example of the contrast and contradictions of Chicago. Here on the left, you have the sign that leads into a certain set of homes. And what it says there is no speeding, no gang activity, no loud music, no loitering, no car repairing, no ball playing. But of course, the reference is to the no gang activity. It is that common in the streets of Chicago that even apartment housing, apartment complexes, or any kind of property will reference it. To the right on the top, you have current gang graffiti uh, existing on dwellings. These are houses in the uh, south side of Chicago. Uh, and basically what will happen is if you were to rent an apartment in Chicago and you were to be discovered as a member of a gang or an organization that is not allowed in that neighborhood, you would be identified by the opposition and your landlord would evict you. There is no housing court. There is no process. There's basically, you have to get out because they're coming to kill you. And that's still very much uh, a reality today. Underneath that, you see a mural dedicated to cultural pride. And that is the contrast in Chicago. You will see memorials dedicated to children who were killed at the hands of violence, not necessarily just because of gangs, but just violence in general. And then you'll see a call to action for cultural awareness cultural pride, and social and communal upliftment. And it's in that contrast that the residents of Chicago live on a daily basis. When you're looking at, before we get into the expansion and things like that, when you're looking at transnational gangs, that phenomena in the city of Chicago, you really cannot look at one city in the United States and not look at the whole country, right? We're going to focus on Chicago, but you really have to think about the entirety of the United States. And what comes with the entirety of the United States is that allure of the American gangster, the American mafioso, the Al Capone, if you will, the Scarface, and how that 
uh, those stereotypical characters create an allure for individuals outside of the United States to uh, glamorize their existence. When you look specifically at Chicago, a name that everybody's most likely familiar with is Al Capone. And Al Capone was obviously a member of the mafia back in the, in the 20s, very early age, yeah, or part of the 19th century. It's amazing to say 19th century, now it makes you feel. 1900s, excuse me, not the 19th century, in the 1900s makes us feel a little bit older for those of us who've been around that long. Um, and you think about uh, what is the romanticism of, of Al Capone, and what you see is an individual who was the bodyguard of a gangster that came out of Brooklyn, New York, went to Chicago to make money uh, in addition to his criminal enterprise in New York, and had Al Capone as a member of his entourage, and he was his lead bodyguard. Around that same time, the United States decides to implement the law of prohibition. During that time, Chicago is a hot spot because of how central it is to the rest of the United States. The train system is there, the port is there, it's a hub. The, tr the trucks and the Teamsters Union left, came out of Chicago, so it was a hub. And when the United States ultimately uh, instituted prohibition, there was an opportunity for the criminal element to engage in what we called bootlegging, which was the selling of alcohol illegally. Now you gotta understand, at this time, you have the mafia in Chicago, you have the mafia in New York, you have the mafia in Florida, you have the mafia pretty much wherever they wanna be. But they're all pretty much focused on their own region and their own area. It's not until the time of prohibition that they see a need and a, and a desire to communicate with one another and form a council to ultimately manage the transportation of the illegal liquor that they're now selling throughout the country. Prior to that, they just simply kind of stood to their own er areas. Prohibition comes at the hands of the United States government and sets the stage for the mafia to ultimately create this council. In creating that council, what we end up seeing is a connection of criminal elements throughout the country. In 1933, prohibition is reversed, alcohol is no longer illegal. However, the mafia now has X amount of time working together, understanding the benefit of that counsel for their financial gain, and they utilize narcotics in place of liquor. When they make that decision, you're understanding that a lot of these old school Italian mafia groups were not in favor of narcotics being sold. And so what they said was, we don't want to get involved, but we still want the money from this business. What do we do? What do you propose we do? And Al Capone decided to actually organize the gangs in Chicago to work for the mob. And the gangs would be the ones that would do the dirty work. They would ultimately sell and distribute the narcotics within their community, and of course the mafiosos wouldn't have to worry about it. So again, it's another example of understanding the importance of learning American history to understand why things are the way they are. Just because we don't live on the same land doesn't mean the issues that face our people don't live there. Our flag is going to fly wherever it can bring people together. This is from a conversation had with a member of the Universal Zulu Nation out of Chicago. The Zulu Nation is a gang that exists originally from New York, but does have a presence in Chicago. Most notably, they are affiliated with the hip hop culture. Uh, individuals such as Africa Bambada and, and the like are known members of the Zulu Nation. This individual was speaking to me about the expansion and what causes the expansion of a transnational organization. And one of the things that you want to understand is that Chicago does not care about anything that's not really Chicago. That's, that's something that, that you always have to remember. They will, they will ultimately uh, involve other cities and states in their business, but Chicago's problems remain Chicago's and everybody else's problems remain their own. They don't necessarily want that uh, drama brought into their area because it's bad for business. The organizations, however, end up expanding through means such as social media, the internet, it's not so much recruitment from the gangs themselves as much as it is a desire from people in other countries and other cities to affiliate themselves with names and groups that have what they consider to be prestige. 
The crown shines wherever we are because we carry that love in our hearts. Latinos have enemies all over the world, and so all over the world, they need to have support. That's where we come in. This is a conversation had with a member of the Latin Kings in Chicago, addressing the, one, the, the question as to how did the almighty Latin King nation expand into other countries. When you look at issues that promote these groups to exist, one of the main themes that continually repeats itself is gentrification, okay? Locations of historical relevance to street organizations and gangs that are often referred to in studies have been destroyed, uh, housing projects have been completely uh, uh, annihilated, leaving the population to have to fend for themselves and go someplace else, which they cannot afford. It usually ends up being people of color who are regularly displaced, uh, and the focus ends up becoming up and coming neighborhoods. And what you have is law enforcement overexerting their power on the citizens who previously lived there. So imagine if you all are students here at the UPF, and this is where you all can afford to come, and this is where you are, and then the government just knocked it down, didn't give you a place to go, and then arrested or harassed you for being in this vicinity. That's something that is very much a problem in Chicago. The segregation of, 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 the, of the races in Chicago is still a prevalent issue in 2021, despite uh, claims of equality and, and communal empowerment. Neighborhoods in Chicago are very much identified by race. Sometimes it isn't that the neighborhood is getting worse, it is that the overcrowding is getting worse. You put more people in the mix and the result is that crime increases. The neighborhood doesn't get worse, it just looks that way because there are more people. This is a conversation with a teacher at a, at a high school in Chicago. The overpopulation in neighborhoods as a result of gentrification has reached phenomenal proportions. And again, keep in mind, this is a, this is a city where if you're Italian, you live in the Italian neighborhood. Whether you can afford it or not, that's where you live. If you're black, you live in the black neighborhood. If you're Latino, but you're Puerto Rican, you live in the Puerto Rican neighborhood. Dominican, the Dominican neighborhood, so forth and so on. They give little leeway for the inter mixing of races in Chicago. These pictures are examples of what exists every day in Chicago. Right now, this picture, I'm using the laser. This picture right here of the Walgreens uh, for any of you who are familiar with the history of the Young Lords, which is a Puerto Rican organization that came out of Chicago, they're famous for one of their first acts of political, uh, uh, taking a political stance and civil disobedience, was they took over the United People's Church. They took over a church in the city of Chicago and they declared it a church for the people. That church has been knocked down, there's a Walgreens there now, uh, and that Walgreens has been there for about 20 years. So there's no regard to the history of these landmarks. To the right, you have images from the south side of Chicago who have yet to fully be gentrified, abandoned houses, abandoned businesses. This is the norm until corporations come in and decide to reinvest in that neighborhood, it will remain that way. Uh, they, and even though there's homelessness and people in need of locales, they don't have access to these resources because they're in the process of being pushed out. That element of circumstance really does lend itself to individuals feeling helpless, feeling as though they have nothing to lose, feeling as though they're not wanted. And so when people have nothing to live for, they ultimately are willing to die for just about anything. And when they're angry at phantoms because there's no corporation standing on the corner saying, I'm gentrifying you, they're angry at the situation, they eventually turn on each other. Criminal activity is something that's associated with gangs almost, you know, they, they go hand in hand in, in the eyes of many individuals, but it shouldn't be looked at in that way. Now, in Chicago, there is a large criminal element, right? Uh, trafficking of narcotics is currently controlled by the Mexican cartels and the mafia. Gang members are being used as soldiers. Uh, gun violence has been out of control in Chicago for decades. Each and every weekend, you're looking at reports of double-digit shootings taking place in Chicago. This isn't something that you have to plan. Literally pick a weekend, Google it, and you're going to find a number that's anywhere between 30 and 60. 
and violent crimes have seen an increase in 2020 over previous years. This is not simply gang related. This is just within communities of color in the city of Chicago. What happens is that you still have a gang element and an organizational element on top of that overlay. As a result of that, you end up having to redefine terms such as mediation. You end up having to redefine terms such as peace. We are literally talking about if the weekend only had 20 shootings, then things are getting better. That's the mentality that a lot of the Chicagoans have because it is so prevalent to them that there is no concept of we're gonna sit down and talk this out. We can't even get the people to stop shooting at each other. And it's not, again, it's not just gangs, but it, that's, that's the stigma that it's the gangs. But there's so much violence and crime there that the people are just almost numb to it. It is important to note in 2021, as of September 1st, 2,951 people have been shot in Chicago as of September 1st. That's over a month ago. That number is clearly over 3,000 now. Mathematically, we're talking at, at the end of the year, it's gonna be anywhere from the equivalent to 10 to 20 people a day being shot in the city of Chicago, okay? This is a, a reality that they live in. The irony of this statistic is that it is virtually impossible to purchase bullets in the city of Chicago because there aren't any. As a result of COVID, in the last couple of years and what has been seen in many cities, there's been a disparity and there's a, a basically a, a discontinuance of availability of firearms and ammunition. However, that clearly has not affected the numbers in Chicago as the shootings for the same time last year, or the, excuse me, the, uh, 2020, were 9% less than they are now. That leads to the point of, again, organized crime on a level of mafia and cartel that are subsequently providing ammunition for their enterprise. We do what we have to do to survive. We don't wake up thinking about destroying our community. We wake up thinking about how it is we're going to survive in it. This is a quote from a 17-year-old Latin king in a conversation we had in March of last year when we asked him to speak about why do you think the violence exists. The people of Chicago, on a, on a general level, again, this is all very general, the young people are used to this level of violence and is accepted as a part of life. Many of them wish it would change, but they are actually adapting to it. They literally know how to walk down the street, what block to cross, what corner not to go around, where to go to stores, where to buy their groceries. It's all separated and they're basically taught how to live that way. Efforts from the outside. So we have organizations that have always been trying to reduce the violence, right? There's religious groups have always been known to try to lend a helping hand in terms of stopping the violence. We have many nonprofits that exist in Chicago that promote culture, the arts, community empowerment, and they are phenomenal in the work that they do. The problem is that the violence is so abundant and so consistent that they literally organize their events and activities around hot times of the year, certain times of the weekend, if it, it, the temperature, depending on how hot it is, if it's worth having the event or not. They basically are trained to organize around the violence, knowing that no singular event is going to necessarily end it. The irony here is organizations such as Ceasefire, which originated in the streets of Chicago, receives millions of dollars of government contract money to engage their program, which they started in Chicago, across the country and other hot cities, other hot spots, uh, as well as other countries outside of the United States. But they were not successful in Chicago. This speaks to the political glorification of trying to do good and being the savior. We're going to pump all this money into the system, and we're doing a good job stopping the violence. Clearly you're not, okay? It went up from the year before. How do we respond to that? Let's give them more money and send them to another city to do the same thing. The model for these organizations was to hire ex-gang members 
and, and they would basically go into the neighborhood and stop the violence because they had what the organization would call street credibility. These individuals can go back into the hood and say, hey, you know who I am and I'm telling you stop the violence. Well, that worked in theory in the 90s. The younger generation now does not have the same concept of loyalty, nor do they have the same concept of respect. So what we're seeing now are some of the older members of street organizations, even they cannot go into the neighborhoods and say, hey, let's talk about peace, because these young people just really don't care. I started the presentation with a memorial photo of, uh, of young Toledo when he was shot by the cops. Now that was a very hot topic in the United States. Young Mexican boy killed by the police. A lot of community activists wanted to start and end the conversation there. He was killed by the police. We have to defund the police and it was a case of police brutality. However, what ends up happening is these individuals literally stand on a corner and they shoot at the other block. And the shooting took place about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Toledo was involved. And that's what this particular group does. They shoot across the street because that's where the other gang is that they don't get along with. And they just shoot at each other. That is the norm, unfortunately. This is a quote from a person who worked for Ceasefire. Listen carefully to how he discusses how they reach their, their goal. Yeah, we got the numbers to go down, but that was just the numbers. We didn't really get the crime down. We would hire leaders of the gangs and make it very clear what neighborhoods needed to improve. We really didn't have job security like that because we had a yearly budget that could have been pulled at any time. So we just made sure the numbers were where they needed to be. Did we help people? Yeah, yeah, of course we did. But helping people in a situation and helping erase the situation are two different things. So they manipulated the outcome by saying, okay, you need the numbers to go down this weekend because there's a festival. All right, everybody, check it out. Don't shoot nobody this weekend. Just give it until, until Monday. And then they would just wait till the following week and then go back and shoot what they wanted to shoot the week before. And as crazy as it sounds, it's sad that this is the norm. You know, it's, it's, it's some Hollywood Netflix series drama that they are living in. And keep in mind, Chicago is not a right to bear arms city. Illinois is not a right to bear arms state. If you're wondering what that means, the state of Arizona is a right to bear arm, conceal and open carry state. Meaning that you can move to the state of Arizona on Monday morning, get your ID, your driver's license by Monday afternoon, and purchase a gun Monday evening and put it in your bag. And it is completely legal. Nobody has to see it. Nobody has to know you have it. So the assumption is that everybody has a firearm. Meanwhile, in Chicago, such is not the case. And yet their gun violence is, oh, their gun violence, excuse me, is absolutely heartbreaking. Here is an example of another contradiction between what Chicago presents and what Chicago actually is. On the left, you have a flyer from an organization in the south side of Chicago speaking to uh, creating a sanctuary for the people. Black Lives Matter, immigrants, we have no walls, women, your bodies are your own, queer, non-conforming, trans people, you are seen and loved, individuals with disabilities, you make us stronger, Muslims, you are honored, young people, your voice is powerful, you are safe here, you belong. This, uh, that flyer is two blocks away from where a young girl was shot waiting in the drive through of a McDonald's with her father because the individuals that were looking to harm the father just decided to shoot the car and they ended up killing the seven-year-old girl. This was two blocks away from where that flyer is posted. Then you have on the right, uh, in the Humble Park area of the north side of Chicago, you have El Mercado del Pueblo. This is a market that takes place in the summertime every weekend. It goes through the winter if they have the, the, the individuals to do so, of local artisan and local entrepreneurship. People of the community come in and sell their goods. It's a great idea, great resource for the children, 
Great place for the community to feel proud. It is open about 10 o'clock, closes about 5, cannot stay open too late because it's the weekend. And that's, that's an example of them knowing we can't stay open late on the weekend because people are going to go to the park and they're going to shoot each other. So we have to close before the sun goes down. Okay. What do we go from here with respects to Chicago? Well, the situation in Chicago is, is not unique to Chicago, right? But it has to, the one in Chicago has to be addressed by the people who reside in that city. There is no one size fits all that's gonna work across the United States. Research conducted in Chicago must continue to be done so with an understanding that we're taking a snapshot of a fluid situation. It is only accurate in the moment that we took that snapshot. If I have a conversation with a group of young people on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., their reality, the one that they share with me that afternoon, is only valid until the ending of that meeting. They can walk out of there and have a whole different set of issues that were unbeknown to me. They can walk out of that meeting with me and have issues because of the meeting with me. Because somebody else says, you know what, who are you talking to? Who are, you know, is that the cops? Is that the government? Is that somebody trying to infiltrate us? The paranoia that exists in communities of color in the United States is something to be reckoned with. And so it's very important that as we plan our next steps with respects to research, that we understand we cannot be saviors, and ultimately the answer has to come from the people that live there. We also need to understand that there are tremendous biases that are brought to this kind of work, both by those who do research as well as those who are being researched. We also need to own, as uh, again, as an American, unfortunately, in, in my country, they glamify, they, 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 they glamorize this American gangster concept. They glamorize the criminal element. It is something that people love to flock to. To the point that in Las Vegas, Nevada, there is a mob museum. Four floors dedicated to the celebration of the mob in the United States of America. Complete with a speakeasy on the basement floor, which a speakeasy is basically what they would call illegal gatherings for people to buy alcohol. So during the time of prohibition, you couldn't have a bar because it was illegal. So you would have these little hole in the walls, these little alleys, basements, if you will, and they would be called speakeasies. You had a code, you had to get in with the code, and you were able to buy the liquor there. There's a building that exists in Las Vegas, Nevada, dedicated to the mob. As if that wasn't ironic enough, the museum itself is a former courthouse. It is the courthouse that held the largest trial against the mafia in Las Vegas. And it's now a museum celebrating what the mafia did and did not do. Complete with interactive exhibits where you can mock the blood oath of joining the Italian mafia and they have you ask certain questions, answer questions, you hit the screen and then it tells you you're part of the family. Now, I mean, it's, it's it's, again, it's, it's, it's something that leads you to a gift shop, romanticizing the Godfather and Capone and pretty much all of that stuff. These two plates are examples of an exhibit from the Mob Museum. They have this for all of the major states and cities that had criminal activity from the Mafia in it. What you're looking at are the two plates that represent the or origin of the mafia in Chicago and whether or not it's still around. And it says, under organized crime in Chicago, the historic second city, Chicago was the only rival to New York in underground crime syndicates. A wide open town, it thrived as a home for mobsters and crooked politicians. Just something else that needs to be explored. When you're doing this kind of research, you understand you cannot speak to mediation among people in the community without understanding the socioeconomic conditions that go into it, with not understanding the political corruption that breeds the social economic conditions that encourage people to engage in criminal activity. So it says, with so much commerce at hand, it was easy for the syndicates to engage in legitimate businesses in order to cultivate influence with respective public officials and labor unions. 
Its record of homicides had no rival during the Prohibition era as each new day seemed to bring another gang-related murder. Think about that. This is the 1920s. Prohibition started in the 1920s. And in here, they're talking about Chicago had no rival in daily murders. Still doing the same today. Giacomo Big Jim Colosimo started the outfit and was one of the first Chicago mob bosses before he was slain on orders from his underboss and successor, Johnny Torrio, in 1920. This is history that has been preserved as, as, and presented as being synonymous with American culture. Again, this is from a museum dedicated to this. Second plate reads, are they still around? The backbone of the Chicago outfit was finally broken in the mid-2000s in what was known as Operation Family Secrets. In one of the largest organized crime cases in U.S. history, 14 underworld members, including two mob bosses, were indicted for numerous crimes, including 18 murders. All the defendants were found guilty in September 2007. While the outfit still exists to some extent, new types of crime organizations operate in Chicago as they do in other cities across the United States today. Today's transnational gangs include members of Eastern Europe and Mexican cartels that supply drugs to local street gangs. All in all, when you're talking about understanding how transnational gangs came to be out of Chicago, you have to look at the immigration policies of the United States, the political policies of the United States surrounding deportation, and understanding how people entered into other countries because they either come, couldn't come to the United States or they were deported from the United States, and how they brought with them that allure of the American experience. Unfortunately, uh, crime is not going anywhere, and Chicago is not necessarily interested in mediation at this point. Uh, there's an entire generation who absolutely does not care about who they kill, how they kill them, or why they kill them. Uh, to the point uh, several years ago, if you look at the potency of social media, about six years ago there was a young man who thought it cool to record himself in the neighborhood of a rival gang, posted on YouTube and Instagram and said, I'm here live in such and such a street and I represent so and so and I'm here in such and such a hood and can't nobody tell me anything because this is how we roll. And while he was filming his live video, they came, they shot him in the head. That's normal. So when you understand those normalities, you then understand we have to redefine mediation, we have to redefine youth groups, we have to redefine community involvement, we have to address the fact that the police and the community are at odds right now. There's not a lot of confidence on either side. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, corona, the coronavirus has not helped the situation at all because it has added to the anxiety level of the community. People have been fiending to kind of express themselves and be out in the street. The United States of America only saw a drop in mass shootings when we were quarantined. I mean, think about that. The only time the United States stopped having mass shootings was when we were quarantined during COVID. They released the restrictions and within three days, there were five mass shootings. There was a mass shooting last week on the 6th in a school in Texas. And mass shootings are defined by a certain number of victims. This is, not to, this is not to water down people who are just randomly shooting other people. Not to mention just the fighting. It's not just about shooting. The latest issue we have now is that there have been multiple cases in New York and in Chicago where hostesses or waiters have been beaten in restaurants for asking for verification of COVID vaccine or the wearing of masks. These social issues affect how we can do our research and what we are researching. If we approach this looking simply for the answers on how to fix the world from the young people, then we are doing them a disservice and displaying ignorance on our part. There has to be a connectivity to how we got here, the history of the city, the history of the country, and again, the ownership of politicians and the role they play in ensuring that the status quo remains the way it does. That is a glimpse at 
how crazy it is in Chi-Town. And for those of you who have uh, Netflix or all these other movie things, there's a movie called Chirac. It's a spy, Chirac. It's C-H-I, Rack. And they spell it like Iraq, but instead of the I, it's Shy. C-H-I. I believe Spike Lee put that movie together. The reason they call it Chirac is because that is the nickname of Chicago. And to put it in perspective, Chicago is just a city in the state of Illinois. Chicago's not that big. It's big, but it's not that big. It's literally just a slither of the state. And they call it Chirac because more people have died at the hands of gun violence in the city of Chicago than American soldiers in Iraq. So that is the life that they live. That's it. Thanks a lot, William, for your presentation and sharing your ideas and impressions from Chicago. Um, so now we would like to open the round for comments or questions. I will enter again. Let's see if we have some. Ah, yes, we have a question from Jose. Um, so William, taking the idea that it is the Mexican cartels and the Italian mafia that control the market for the sale of drugs, do you think that violence among Latinos is being encouraged by these organizations and that without their presence it would not exist or would be less? And the second question, and how is the relation with the black community? So I think the, if you look at how the mafia went from focusing on illegal alcohol to narcotics at the end of prohibition as a result of a way to maintain their business. Uh, I think if we look at that, we'll understand that if narcotics did not play a role in today's society, something else would. Uh, so do I think that, that, that they're gonna go away? I don't. Do I think if, if they were absent, that there would be a decline in violence? I think we would see a decline possibly in gun violence simply because you cannot access bullets under the normal market in the city of Chicago right now. They just don't exist. You go to a store, they just don't have any bullets. And if they do have bullets, you're talking about a pack of 25 nine millimeter bullets that under normal circumstances would cost you anywhere from 16 to $25, now running you about $60 as a result of COVID and, the, and there's a scarcity of them. So if I think the mafia or the cartel were to exit the picture, I think that we would see a decline in violence that is related to guns. I do not think we would see a decline in communal violence because I think the deterioration of humanity has gone on for so long that the community is just angry and lashing out. To tie that into the second part of the question, the black community and the Latino community are extremely segregated in Chicago. Uh, there are obviously pockets of unity but on a general scale, they do not get along. Uh, and a lot of the murders that you see that are actually gang related end up being the black gangs or the African American gangs uh, because their leadership structure is different. So what you're seeing at, in the African American community, it was more territorial. Uh, for any of you who watched American television in the 80s and 90s, there used to be a show called Good Times. And that show was a very popular show filmed in Chicago. They were in the projects. The project they lived in was Cabrini Green Projects. The black community, their gangs tend to focus more on the territory that they're in. Gentrification has a greater effect on them because when they knock down a housing project or they tear down a community, those people are then dispersed. They don't have any real place to go. They then have to relocate into another neighborhood. They bring with them that gang mentality. What they don't bring with them is the structure that existed in that housing project. So before we were 100 and we all followed so-and-so, now we got dispersed all over. So I'm going to start my own version of the gang. I'm not listening to so-and-so anymore. This is my neighborhood. And then they start fighting amongst each other. During the uh, height 
of the protests in the United States uh, surrounding George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and police brutality. It was a video that surfaced in the south side of Chicago where you had African Americans speaking to Mexicans that were claiming to be Latin Kings in the little village area of Chicago. And the conversation was basically the Latin Kings saying, hey, we're not going to allow you to riot in this neighborhood. We're going to protect the stores. We're going to protect the, the store owners. You're not going to riot. Now, perception is everyone's reality. What you get from that video is, is what you believe it to be. But there's more to it. You have to read between the lines. The, the Mexican gang believed simply because you were black, you were going to riot. Hence, they did not allow any blacks in that neighborhood because they said, if you're black, it's a Black Lives Matter rally, you're going to riot. They associated them all together. Furthermore, on a normal day, the blacks are not allowed on that side of the neighborhood anyway. So now they were just using the political propaganda of we're protecting the neighborhood to further their agenda. So unfortunately, on a street level, on a gang level, uh, there's still very, very strong racial divides um, that uh, ensure there's always some kind of problem between blacks and Latinos in the city of Chicago. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe related with this question, I would l be interested in getting to know a little bit more if you can describe just very briefly like the different gangs that exist in Chicago. Maybe do they have a long history or they're recent? Uh, which profile do they have? Where do they come from? Just, I, I mean, maybe it's a very big issue, but maybe you can just given short overview, so we all. There's very, very easy way to answer that. So Chicago has always been a breeding ground for multiple groups, right? We look at research that we'll be talking about in another event tomorrow, well, you know, Robert, uh, you look at Thrasher's research on the gangs. This is an individual who in 1920s researched 1,300 gangs in the city of Chicago. But you have to understand, these gangs existed in corners, in neighborhoods, they were small pockets of resistance. So you could have one block with four sides, and on those, and that one block, you can have anywhere from four to eight gangs, depending on how big or wide the block was or how it was shaped. Uh, and and they, they were not considering themselves these tremendous organizations. They were just very small groups, okay? You think about the, your friends that you always have lunch with, that's a gang. You and your buddy and your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever, that's a gang. And that's how they functioned for the longest period of time until prohibition because those gangs were just pretty much focused on what they were concerned with. I mean, if, if, if UPF were a gang, it would only be worried about right here. It really wouldn't care where the train station is because they're focused on here. And so all these little groups existed. During Prohibition, again, the Mafia sat out and said, you know what, we need workers. You guys are all going to work for us now. And that's how they started to align the groups. Now, we don't see another change until the 60s when you start having the Black Panthers. You start having groups wanting to be a little bit bigger. You got to understand, Chicago gangs in the 40s, 50s, and 60s functioned in a very West Side Story kind of way. I'm my crew, you're your crew. I'm the William Rosses, you're the Nellies. So now we fight. If I win, your crew is now part of the William Rosses. If you win, we're now part of the Nellies. And that's just how they function. Um, but again, because of the racial divide, North and South, North usually was more predominantly Puerto Rican, South was predominantly Mexican. They had those cultural divides. Eventually, they kind of split up. Then in, again, we start seeing movements of, of civil rights. We see the Black Panthers come on board. We see organizations like the Young Lords, the Rainbow Coalition. There was a desire for groups to be politically conscious. That political consciousness is what ultimately caused Group A, who was a small group, and Group B, who's another small group, to come together and be one larger group. 
That is where we start seeing the bigger gangs, the gangster disciples, the almighty Latin king nation, the Spanish cobras, the uh, imperial gangsters. These are larger gangs that were comprised of a lot smaller ones. What happens? Time goes on. There's infiltration from, again, the mafia and the cartel. And it's no longer about a loyalty to the organization as much as it is dollars and cents. So I mentioned earlier that the African-American gangs are affected more by gentrification than the Hispanic gangs. It's not because the Hispanics have housing and the blacks don't. It's because the cartel works primarily through the Mexican gangs and then goes to the black gangs. So if the black gang says, well, hey, you know, John is no longer in control and I'm going to move over here and I'm going to start my own version and I'm going to move over there and start my own version, they can do that because nobody's stopping them. The Mexican gangs or the Hispanic gangs cannot do that because the cartel would come in and say, look, we don't really give a shit what your problem is. This is the job that you have to do, and this is how you're going to do it. Whatever you want to call yourself while you're doing it doesn't bother me. I don't care. What I care about is it getting done. So if I put you in charge, you're in charge. And that's it. And there's the end of the discussion. So unfortunately, the crime, the criminal element, is what's keeping uh, the Hispanic gangs from splintering off as greatly as the African-American gangs. However, something that even the cartel cannot control is the rebelliousness of this generation of young people. Uh, these blessed generation, I don't even know what we're up to, the generation poca vergüenza, I don't know. So this particular generation has such a detachment of any kind of conviction that they don't care. When I was growing up, there was a concern that video games were gonna make people violent, right? And the video games didn't even look like they do now, okay? I, I go to a store now, I thought I was watching a trailer to a movie. I was like, that looks like a really good movie. I can't wait till it comes out. It wasn't even a movie, it was a video game. Okay, so that's a lot different than what they looked like when I was growing up. Now, I was in Chicago the other day and we were told we had a meeting in the corner where the gangster disciples originated and we were told you need to leave this corner because it's not safe for y'all to be in the car and it was because they were playing real life Grand Theft Auto. They were just snatching people out of their car, shooting them or beating them up and taking the car. So these are young people. When they asked them why, the answer was, you never played Grand Theft Auto? I mean, we just playing it in real life. So there's such a disdain for human life that they don't care. And as a result of that, they're just pushing the envelope over and over and over again. And they're making themselves numb, recording it, watching it, playing the videos over. There's no, they don't care. And so as a result, they splinter off, not as their own group, but just as kids who just don't care. Thanks a lot. Um, do you have any more questions here in the public? Um, yes, Maria. Um, I wanted to ask you regarding the, um, the situation you, you tell about this new generation, mm -hmm. how is education like there? I mean, how is public education? I understand these people you are talking about use the public education system. So how is the public education system? And if there is something being done from public education system from childhood to prevent, apart from that, projects you say that are mainly like to, to fix violence, but to prevent violence um, among kids. Thanks. So Chicago has some phenomenal programs that they wrap up in, in, uh, in cultural relevance. For example, there is a Pedro Albizu Campos High School. Pedro Albizu Campos was the first Puerto Rican to graduate Harvard University. Uh, he was a lawyer. He was the president of the Party for Independence of Puerto Rico. Um, very, very well-known figure in Puerto Rican history. There's a high school, a charter high school, which is not a public school. I don't know if they have charter high schools here in Europe, but 
Uh, charter schools in the United States, you have the public school system that is managed by the Department of Education. And then you have charter schools, which are like private schools that don't charge the same tuition as a private school, but they're not regulated in the same way as a public school. So they can do a couple of things that the regular school cannot. And in this particular charter school, they even have a Lolita Lebron program. Lolita Lebron was another Puerto Rican revolutionary figure recognized for being one of the five Puerto Ricans who went into the House of Congress and shot up the House of Congress, claiming they were fighting for the, for the independence of Puerto Rico. Uh, and this particular program is for pregnant students, so pregnant mother, you know, pregnant teens who are looking to maintain the child and don't want to drop out of school, they can be in that program. Those programs exist, but those are charter programs. Uh, the public school system as a whole struggles because it suffers from the same segregation that the rest of the city does. So if you go to the neighborhood where the kids are not killing each other, the school looks very different than the one in the neighborhood of the school that is killing each other. Furthermore, with gentrification, they don't just knock down houses, they knock down schools. So in a city where you can't walk in certain neighborhoods, imagine getting your local high school teared down and now the school you have to go to is the one across town in the neighborhood that you're not even allowed to walk through. All right, so it has to do with the investment in the young people or how they're seen as being expendable. It is a normal practice in the United States that in the third grade, that is when the school system is working with the local government to ascertain the number of prison cells they will need in the coming years. So they're evaluating your third grade child and saying, yep, yeah, this one's gonna be a killer. So let's make sure we got a cell for him or her. And so that's how they focus on the education system. They don't invest in the same way because they really don't expect a return. And then the school system is still plagued by antiquated policies. A teacher comes out of college with a large amount of student loan debt. Again, I, I think the school's free out here, so you guys don't have good old student loans, but we do. And you get these student loans and you can get your degree and your degree could have cost you $150,000. And when you get this loan, you're done, right? You're done with school. You now owe the bank $150,000. Your first job is going to pay you $30,000 on top of all your living expenses, right? So you're not going to pay that anytime soon. What is common practice in the United States is that if you are a Caucasian and you agree to work in an at-risk school, which is black or Latino, they will forgive your student loans if you work there for X amount of time. And uh, they will not do the same for a black or Latino teacher because the logic is you're used to these animals. And so that kind of mindset doesn't afford a great educational system for these socioeconomically depressed neighborhoods, unfortunately. very much um, it was really interesting I guess I, I guess you've spoken quite a bit about ceasefire and about the public school system and about these forms of community intervention which depend on funding via the state depend on governmental funding you also spoke a bit about other forms of kind of community help and so on that, that, that uh, that are external to, to government, that don't depend on government funding, so uh, cultural associations. I, I was just wondering, can you elaborate a little bit on their role, what they do, and kind of how would they relate to harm prevention or reductions in violence and so on and so on? I mean, because I think that one of the points you made was that things like ceasefire depend on this financing, which then gets taken away, mm -hmm. and so everything becomes about securing that financing, mm -hmm. which then has these kind of perverse effects and so on. So 
is there a kind of another avenue of hope or, or, or whatever within community-based organizations? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the community-based organizations that are doing the most work in Chicago are approaching it from a cultural perspective. So not so much addressing the violence per se, but saying, hey, let's be proud of who we are as a community. And if we were proud of being a community, then we would ideally stop killing each other. That's the approach that a lot of the organizations are going. You looked at the Mercado del Pueblo, which, uh, let me see if I can find it again, just to, uh, this is not working, okay. So you look at right here, this particular, um, oh shit. This particular establishment, this is uh, an empty space that was next to a supermarket. It was abandoned for about a year. And ultimately, they sat down and worked with the store owner to allow for people in the community to come in and sell their goods. And in doing so, again, they're establishing that pride in the community, hoping that that's going to curb the violence. The community-based organizations, there are other organizations that are doing specific work to address the violence in their neighborhoods, but they follow the same protocol as the gangs. They will not leave that neighborhood. So if, if you had the UPF model, then the, and there was gang violence in the UPF campus, then the organization that wants to address it will address it by telling those players in the gang, we're only working with you, we're not going anywhere else, let's just stop killing each other here. They won't go to another neighborhood because once they leave, that other neighborhood sees them as members of UPF. So there's really no way to address it citywide from a harm reduction model unless you do more of a community empowerment model. And you say, listen, let's all just get together and, and just celebrate one another without, without the crime. And in this area where this Mercado de Pueblo is, it's in a neighborhood called Paseo, excuse me, Paseo Boricua, six blocks next to the Humble Park area of Chicago, predominantly Puerto Rican, managed by the National Council for Puerto Rico uh, in the city of Chicago. It's an organization that's a nonprofit. The executive director is the brother of former political prisoner Oscar Lopez. In that six block radius, they've been able to create harm reduction models that have been successful. There are no police in those six blocks. Police are not allowed on the, well, I mean, they're not, they're not prohibited, but police don't come on those six blocks because the community polices itself through a grant that the organization has secured. That is an example of a nonprofit engaging in a harm reduction model. That's the pretty side. The flip side of that coin is it cannot leave those six blocks. It has to focus on Puerto Rico and it has to do everything with the flag of the Puerto Rican identity because it, 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 their, their political ties are only for that ethnicity. They won't allow them to go anywhere else. Outside of the six blocks, it's a war zone. In those six blocks, it's not. How do they get those six blocks safe? They have relationships with the gangs as well and they, everybody understands we're just not gonna kill each other in these six blocks. During the summer, there was a Puerto Rican Day Parade. There was a case on the news of a guy and his wife who were taken out of their car by a mob and shot execution style in the middle of the street. Made big news, people in the United States all over the country wanted to protest it. The irony of that is, happens in Chicago all the time. Why was this case any different? And then there were racism, there was racism that really showed itself. The case became prevalent in the media, social media, within the Latino community because it happened after the Puerto Rican Day Parade. So Puerto Ricans were upset that in the news they were showing Puerto Rican flags in association with this murder. Uh, so as you dig deeper, it, it, it goes back to a racial issue. So the harm reduction model can only deal with certain pockets of the community at specific times. And if you wanna deal with a mass population, it has to be done from a cultural perspective. And they get money for it. There's a lot of money in Chicago. It's just that Chicago politics has a history of being as corrupt, if not more, as you see on the movies. Um, William, uh, congrats for your excellent 
um, synthesis of uh, Chicago background. And um, my question is, my interest is also on the historical evolution since the uh, local and, and street corner gangs of the 20s uh, as, as were uh, described in Thrasher's The Gang until today's transnational gangs. But uh, also through, not only through the ethnography, but also through the cinema. You have talked about this glamorization mm -hmm. or this, uh, this process of uh, glori glorification of American gangs, gangs and spe especially Chica Chicago gangs. But um, related to the, se to the seminar or to the series in the uh, Barcelona library, the next week, Margot and me <laughs> have to talk about uh, Chicago gangs or American gangs in the in cinema because the, the original speaker couldn't attend the, the session, and uh, we w I was wondering uh, uh, if the evolution of um, uh, uh, the um, the gangster gender in cinema has a reflection of the evolution of gangs, or on the contrary, the evol evolution of gangs is a consequence in, so in, in some way of the, uh, chick uh, of the American cinema. I was thinking about the classical Gangs of New York by Scorsese, Angels with Dirty Faces by Curtis uh, about gangs in the 30s, after the prohibition that mm -hmm. you described, the, the, the recent Black, the Black Messiah uh, mm -hmm. Writing to the Black la, uh, la, um, um, Black Panthers in the 60s, and even the Chirac by L S S Spike Lee mm -hmm. that I, I didn't I haven't seen this this movie, but there are other more realistic movies or or not. So I I I believe it's a it's a relationship of of mutual effect. So the cinema is affected by the the real life, and the real life inspires the cinema simultaneously. Chirac is more of a uh, exaggerated documentary, if you will. It's like a cinematic mm -hmm. version. They made a movie out of what was happening and it, it's more palpable, more palpable than, a, than a documentary. You look at movies like Gangs of New York and they're talking about how immigration was forming groups. Now you watch a movie like Gangs of New York and the whole focus is on these two major gangs, right? Ironically, they're not talking about the immigrational policies that, that brought those immigrants there. They're not talking about the role the United States played in the immigration policies of other countries, what was happening in other countries that inspired the immigrants, the immigrants to come to the United States. And there's a very climactic scene in that Gangs of New York movie where all of the local gangs, which consider themselves natives, fight all of the immigrant gangs. And, and they consider them obviously the outsiders or whatnot. And, and that scene is climactic because it speaks to an issue that the cinema is not really talking about, which is the racial component. Before we have movies like Gangs of New York, we have the old westerns. What are the westerns? The cowboy. Who's the villain in the western movies? The native, the Indian. But they were there first. So this glorification of the American being this John Wayne badass who comes in and does whatever he wants to do, and they cheerlead that, when there is a clear enemy, which was the person who's not white, which was the native, they celebrated the cowboy, the OK Corral, the, the, the Tombstone movies. You know, they celebrated that. When you start to see the institutions of law enforcement be constructed, now the, 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 the policeman becomes the hero in the movie and the gang becomes the person of color. And, and if you look at these movies that celebrate uh, the, the, the hero as the police, it's the police with the gangster tendencies, the one that's always smacking up somebody that's going above and beyond, that's tough, that's rough, you know, RoboCop shooting people and nobody cares. Those are the kind of ideas that lend themselves to um, this, this racial divide that's in the cinema. The problem then becomes how they glorify it. 
It's not just that there's a Scarface t-shirt. It's that, I mean, it's not just that there's a Scarface movie, it's that there's a Scarface t-shirt. It's that these kids are now being taught lines from the movie Scarface and they remember that before they remember anything that their parents taught them. And that's being glorified. And as a result, cinema has an influence. We see it in music as well. It's a matter of what sells. Now, it could be argued that psychologically, that people of color or the communities who are impoverished and, and socioeconomically depressed communities have so much anger and animosity that they just want to rise up, but they can't, so they watch a person of color in the media rise up, a group rise up. They watch something blow up. And they, I mean, there's a show, a show right now on Netflix, uh, the, the Squid Game, right? Uh, I'm sure it has a different name in Spanish, but it's, it's, it's supposedly the number one show being watched on Netflix right now. It's a remake of a, of a Chinese uh, series where these individuals play a game, and if they lose the game, they die. If they win, they go on to the next game. I think the show starts with an old children's game of red light, green light. And this big monster or big machine says, you know, red light, green light, you know, green light, go. And they run, and red light, and if you move, you get shot. And you die. And they kill you. As every episode goes on, the games get progressively worse. It instantly became a number one hit worldwide. People are, and there's no plot. People are getting killed. Every episode, they play a game, they get killed. There is a, again, deterioration of humanity, and it sells. The movies are not putting out, uh, Hollywood is not putting out movies of happiness and, and, and rainbows and butterflies. They're putting out these, these gory films that are speaking to people's anger and animosity towards one another, and it sells. The Black Messiah is, again, another version of a documentary cinemized so it's more palpable. So it's not so much a movie as much as it is a telling of a story, but gangs of New York and the such, they tell a story, but it's very, very fantastic in how they do it. And so I think that both affect one another. It's just people are not considerate to, uh, to one another. I mean, we're seeing it now with the coronavirus. I mean, somebody can say, I got a vaccine, and somebody can want to fight them because they don't believe in the vaccine or they don't want to wear a mask and so they're fighting in the street. That's a social issue. Gangs just end up being manipulated by them. Because if you look at the, the 60s, the gangs had a more political tone. There was more of a political agenda. That's not because the gangs were politicized. It's because the energy of the time was politicized. There was free love. There was social consciousness. There was unity. That's not the case now. Anybody else? Thanks, William. Um, are there any more questions in the public, wherever? <laughs> I will check again in the emails, but no, we have no more questions. So um, if it's okay for you, I would suggest a brief break, um, and then we will continue on with a uh, Next subject, so William will share with us um, his uh, opinion analysis on the Black Lives Matter movement. And yeah, I hope you, you have the time to stay with us and see you, see you after the short break. Thanks to all of you. So good afternoon to all of you. We will now continue with the second part of our um, Uh, meeting, let's say, with the local researcher of Transgang, William Ross, who is today with us and shares uh, his analysis and opinions uh, on the gangs in Chicago, but now focused on the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the United States. So for um, all of you who connected uh, to the second part of the session, um, if you have any questions at the end of the of this um, of this conference conference of this session, um, we are happy to well we are happy to, that you uh, if you want to share with us comments or or questions uh, on what we are discussing here, and you can write your questions or comments in the Twitter account of Transgang or uh, via email to transgang at 
upf.edu. So um, for all of you who um, are connected now to the, only to the second part, I will present William Ross briefly to you. So William Ross um, is a Transgang local researcher in Chicago. He holds a Bachelor in Business Administration and a Master in Nonprofit Management and Leadership and is currently um, completing a PhD in Public Policy and Administration with a spe specialization in Global Leadership. He's a community organizer and educator with over two decades of experience and expertise uh, with, uh, within street organization. And he's also a member of the almighty Latin King and Queen Nation for over 25 years now. So William, um, welcome to the university uh, in the Thank second you. part. Um, I really, uh, I would like to ask you to share with us your experiences uh, as this uh, um, organizer and educator within uh, street organizations, your um, yeah, your experience with the Black Lives uh, Matters movement, and uh, maybe share with us your like the key elements. Um, yeah, what you regard okay. the key elements of it. Uh, so thank you uh, once again. Uh, the very first thing that we have to say if we're discussing the Black Lives Matter movement or any movement that is born from the Black Lives Matter concept is that the struggle of black people defined in this context as people whose skin is darker in color is something that can only fully be articulated by those individuals that are affected by it. I have to acknowledge any privilege I have socially uh, than any of uh, my darker brothers and sisters in the community, and we need to understand that anything that, that I'm doing per se or anything that anyone who is of a lighter shade is doing is not the same. The world is completely different in the United States depending on the color of your skin. And so regardless of uh, my extensive a work with the Black Lives Matter movement, I always like to begin by articulating the fact that the true essence of that movement can only be articulated by those who are living it day to day, whether they are politicized or not. The color of their skin is not anything that they can control, and yet society judges them on that. Um, so Black Lives Matter, uh, as the organization was a hashtag, if you will, movement, was founded in 2013, 2013, in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer, okay? Uh, Trayvon Martin was a young African-American male who was killed. Uh, he was not armed. He was killed as an act of racial injustice. Uh, and uh, the, the result of that verdict um, was the formation of what we now know as Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, is a global network. Uh, it does have chapters in the United States, the UK, Canada. The mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. Uh, by combating and counteracting acts of violence, creating space for black imagination and innovation, and centering black joy uh, they believe they are winning immediate improvements in their lives. Now, Black Lives Matter was introduced to the society as a hashtag, a hashtag at the end of a social media post that happened eight years ago on July 13th, 2013. That is when the verdict regarding the Trevon Martin case came out. Uh, the murderer was found not guilty. And subsequently, the initial tweet, the very first post on social media that referenced Black Lives Matter read, Declaration, black bodies will no longer be sacrificed for the rest of the world's enlightenment. I am done. I am so done. Trayvon, you are loved infinitely. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. That would eventually create a trend on social media that uh, would be the equivalent to saying something like no justice, no peace. It became a battle cry. 
Black Lives Matter became a rallying point for activists in the black community anytime they would engage in any kind of act of uh, civil disobedience or community organizing or any kind of political act, their chant would be Black Lives Matter, their hashtag would be Black Lives Matter. Uh, the three black organizers who created the hashtag and subsequently the organization were Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tometi. Uh, they ultimately created what we now know as this movement called Black Lives Matter. However, it quickly grew to something that was incontrollable. So a hashtag, which was a rallying cry, a battle cry for people to organize under, they then constructed an organization. In constructing an organization, that organization has Found, uh, has chapters that they recognize, has rules, has laws. They're bound by organizational protocols within the United States. They also have a philanthropic arm, which is Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. Uh, and that part of the organization works on long-term work where uh, black folks across the diaspora can thrive in the community. But it still remains a hashtag so now you have a hashtag, an actual organization with leadership, and a philanthropic movement. All three things meant to be a part of the same collective, but they couldn't be further away from the truth because the Black Lives Matter hashtag has spread to a movement with no hierarchy. It is simply a battle cry. People are screaming profusely, Black Lives Matter, and it has generated uh, a counter response of all lives matter, or when speaking about defunding the police, blue lives matter uh, in, in the city of New York where they're referencing the, the police officer's uniform being blue. Uh, or it's a common uniform reference to the police that, they're, that it's blue. So th there's all these movements that have ensued as a result of a battle cry that is being responded to. So you have individuals referencing Black Lives Matter everywhere in the United States, but there is not a chapter of the organization Black Lives Matter in every state of the United States. It's just, again, individuals using that battle cry. Unfortunately, as with everything that cannot be controlled, uh, there are individuals taking advantage of it. Um, there are individuals who are skeptical of the leadership of the organization. There are individuals who feel it should not be an actual organization. It should just continue to be a, a, a rallying cry for the community. And its expansion across the seas to Europe and, and other countries creates a different issue because this concept of black is more an Americanized thing. Uh, as a, it's not so much an ethnicity, they're, they're specifically referencing their skin color. I recall one time coming out of uh, an Afro-Cuban uh, cultural event in uh, La Habana, Cuba, with a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement from Atlanta. There were these two African-American girls from Louisiana walking up the street, and the Cubans asked them, hey, where are you from? you know, America, America, you know, typical conversation between a Cuban and a tourist walking down the street. And she quickly turned around and snapped and said, I'm not American, I'm African American. And he said, were you born in Africa? And she said, no, I wasn't, I was born in Louisiana. He said, then you're American, you're not African American, you're American. And she said, well, I'm black. And he said, are you a crayon? Because we don't look at it that way here. And she was highly offended because she felt that how she identified herself ethnically was not respected in this other country. And we're seeing a lot of that in community organizing uh, with respects to the hashtag of Black Lives Matter. Um, again, this is no longer about the organization that exists with the philanthropic arm. This is about the hashtag and the call that people then feel associated with. Um, Black Lives Matter has become a statement to mean so many things in the community, both positive and negative. 
Uh, unfortunately, on the negative side, from an organizing perspective, we are seeing an abundance of, unfortunately, racism in the black and Latino community where Latinos are celebrating their African roots and African Americans are saying, you're not black enough to claim Black Lives Matter. You're not black enough to claim your African ancestry. Uh, or you're claiming it at your convenience because you don't have to deal with the dark skin that I have. And so we're actually seeing Black Lives Matter having a divisive effect as a hashtag, as a social movement. Um, organizationally, their agenda is different. Uh, they do great work. They're constantly uh, keeping individuals abreast as to current events that are transpiring in their local neighborhoods. But again, an organization with about 13 to 15 chapters versus anywhere there is a black person, Black Lives Matter could be used as a hashtag. Uh, and so that, that movement without a hierarchy is presenting some challenges, especially within the Latino community who is constantly having to defend its African roots uh, to individuals who wanna challenge it. So, that's where we find ourselves now with respects to the movement. Uh, it, it's just, again, a catchy phrase that holds so much significance. Uh, the fact is that black lives, African-American lives in the United States and everywhere, but in, in focusing on the United States at the origin of this hashtag, have been devalued, have been abused. The history of the United States is written in the blood of not only African slaves, but uh, indigenous individuals who were massacred. Uh, yesterday, there were countless protests um, in, you know, in, in honor of the fact that many cities and states have changed Columbus. Yesterday was Columbus Day in the United States. I think here it was Dia de la Hispanidad or you know, you know, that day. And so in the United States, it's Columbus Day, but a lot of cities have changed Columbus Day to be Indigenous Peoples Day. The irony is you would think that that's a rallying cry for people to get together, but now you have these people who say that I'm Afro-Indigenous. You know, we understand that if man was created in Africa, that's the first man that was found was in Africa, that the African man or woman went throughout the world and populated the planet, so forth and so on. There are Afro-Mexicans, Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Peruvians, Afro-Ecuadorians, so forth and so on, but there is still a divide in a lot of pockets in the community between Black Lives Matter and the Afro-Latino community. Uh, because again, the philosophy is you're not black enough and you can enjoy the benefits of fairer skin, whereas a darker person cannot. And so Black Lives Matter has become equally a unifying point as much as a dividing point, depending on the cause, depending on the, um, the, the individuals involved in that local city, uh, depending on any number of things. From an organizing perspective, in the street organizing community, Black Lives Matter is seen as a middle class uh, way to appease their social justice need. They're not talking to gangs, they're not talking to street individuals, asking to organize, and this is on a very general level. It, it's not to say that the organization is not doing it in certain pockets, I can tell you it's not happening in Chicago. Black Lives Matter does not talk to gangs in Chicago, does not do any kind of street organizing in Chicago. When Black Lives Matter holds an event, it's a hashtag holding an event. It's individuals saying, we're organizing this march in the name of Black Lives Matter. It's not necessarily the organization that you would see online when you go to blacklivesmatter.com. That's a different, different organization. Thanks, William, so, so far for this uh, analysis. I would like to know maybe if you can, have you seen uh, from your perspective or your experience also some this Black Lives Matters movement as an empower, empowering tool in some communities, maybe in some ways, or Absolutely. maybe that serves as an example, uh, like for other 
uh, groups or um, communities to organize them themselves like in the same way or similar ways? There, I, I there's mm -hmm. definitely, again, there's positivity uh, in, in this movement that has ensued from a, from a social media post. Um, the call for Black Lives Matter to, to exist is a call for young men and women of color to really put some value in their life and say, hey, man, I matter, you know, and, 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 I, and, and people are talking about that and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm important. And that, that has positive effects. However, the inspirational qualities of the hashtag, and again, I have to differentiate the hashtag from the organization because there are thought tanks that say, Black Lives Matter as a hashtag should never have been an organization. It could have stood as a hashtag. It's like if I was to incorporate no justice, no peace. That is a very popular term, or si se puede. It's a very popular rally cry. Who am I to incorporate that and say this is now the platform of this statement? Um, and it has inspired a lot of groups to come together, or in a but. It's also inspired certain groups to identify themselves with their own hashtag, and there we find divide. So again, there's Black Lives Matter, and they are in opposition of people who say all lives matter, because they feel that all lives matter is an attempt to water down and wash away the relevance of the term Black Lives Matter. So it, it just becomes uh, something that was taken too far uh, on the negative side. Uh, but again, on the positive, there are many people who are able to see themselves in the work that the organization is doing. They're able to see themselves uh, in the country's redefined focus on the black community, and, and they're happy with that. Representation is a very big deal in the United States. Many people feel that they're not represented enough. And so any time that they can get any recognition, it's a very big deal for them. Now we look at, you know, uh, there's been the Black Lives Matter murals painted in D.C., in New York, and many other cities. Uh, there's been George Floyd monuments that have recently been erected. And that's great, you know, if, if you're looking at the inclusion of a population that feels underrepresented. but that also in turn caused for those murals to be defaced, those monuments to be defaced, and there have been huge battles within the community between people who claim to be Black Lives Matter and everybody else. Um, its expansion across the seas to other countries is troublesome to me because I think you first need to have understanding of global history and a global perspective to, to understand something that comes out of a country like the United States. I could not go back and explain to revolutionaries or wannabe revolutionaries or community organizers that in Spain there are skinheads who are anti-Nazi, who are anti-homophobia, who are, I think what do they call them, the red, red heads or reds, I don't know, some, there's another name for them, but they exist. And so that's not something that they would understand in the United States. And so it's hard to then come out of the United States and say black lives matter because it doesn't speak to an ethnicity. It speaks simply to a color. Thanks a lot, William. Um, I think Carlos has some more questions. Uh, yes, if we, you can answer in Spanish like, that, like this, uh, Cesar can understand this, this question, mm -hmm. this, this special question. Mm -hmm. te, te quisiera preguntar, desde el 2013 uh -huh. hasta uh, pasando por el asesinato de George Floyd y sobre todo el de John, John Toledo, ¿no? Se llamaba el, el joven... Adam, Adam Toledo. Ad, Adam Toledo, perdón. Eh, ¿Cuál es tu tu interpretación sobre todo de, de esta última fa de la evolución del movimiento desde el 13 al, al 2011 y sobre todo eh, el auge que tuvo con, con Floyd y el, el de algún modo la vuelta atrás que el caso Toledo eh, pudo bueno, suponer eh, para la comunidad latina sobre todo. Eso es este interesante caso. porque desafortunadamente muchas veces la comunidad latina dice que la comunidad afroamericana no le interese los asuntos de los latinos. 
Y entonces, sin embargo, los latinos siempre están dispuestos a ayudar a la comunidad afroamericana en toda su lucha, porque nosotros sentimos que tenemos una cultura, una, eh, un, 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 tenemos sangre africana y nosotros identificamos como parte africano normal. Por ejemplo, en Cuba tú no tienes que hablar, ni en Puerto Rico, ni en Santo Domingo, tú no tienes que hablar de tu cultura africana, si no lo ves en las comidas, lo ves en ciertas palabras, lo ves en el baile, lo ves en el movimiento, en cómo nosotros funcionamos, funcionamos de manera de siempre celebrar nuestra cultura africana. Sin embargo, el africano americano, no el africano de África, el africano americano va a decir, ustedes no son suficiente negros para reconocer esa parte de tu cultura. Entonces, por ejemplo, el latino, que dice que es el afro latino, va a decir, pero ven acá, entonces, usted me va a decir a mí que yo no tengo suficiente color en mi pie para celebrar mi cultura africana, pero sin embargo, tú vas a empezar una reunión de Black Lives Matter con, una, con un rezo cristiano, cuando fueron los cristianos que oprimieron a tu ancestro. Nosotros estamos bailando la bomba y la plena y los bailes africanos y estamos celebrando los dioses de África y usted está celebrando a Cristo. Se, según la presidenta de Madrid, esto es la civilización que llevó España a América, eh, la Iglesia Católica. Pero entonces, bueno. pero entonces ese pasa. Entonces, con, con lo que sucedió con Toledo, es que sinceramente no había presencia de la comunidad afro, eh, afroamericana en las manifestaciones que hicieron para, para, para Toledo. No existía. Habían presencia de morenos, no estoy diciendo que no habían afroamericanos ahí. Lo que pasa es que no había una presencia de organización. Si uno se pone a, a, a de, repito y te digo de nuevo, volviendo a lo que yo dije en la presentación anterior, para entender los detalles de este asunto, tiene que estudiar cosas que normalmente la gente piensa que no tiene nada que ver. Y tiene que estudiar la historia de los Estados Unidos para entender de dónde nació el racismo y los problemas entre la comunidad negra y la comunidad hispana. El dicho de, vuelve a tu casa, sal de mi país, que son cosas, go back home, we don't want you here, cosas así, nosotros no te queremos aquí. La gente piensa que eso viene de los gringos o los americanos contra los mexicanos, contra la gente de Sudamérica, y no es así. Eran los afroamericanos contra los mexicanos y empezó eso en California porque cuando la esclavitud termine y grandes termine entonces ¿qué pasa? California pertenecía a México Arizona pertenecía a México Nueva México era México Texas era México todo eso era México entonces ¿qué pasa? viene el americano el John Wayne con su película de Cowboys y viene a California, viene a Texas, viene a otros lugares buscando oro, buscando riqueza. Y se dice bien claro en la historia, buscando una nueva vida. Y la mayoría de la gente que salieron de lo que era Nueva York, Maryland, todos esos lugares, salieron buscando una vida nueva porque cometieron errores allá. A lo mejor cometieron un crimen allá, o perdieron dinero, o eran delincuentes allá. Y como todo el mundo andaba en esa burbujita de Nueva York y Nueva Jersey, salieron a buscar más tierra y más espacio. ¿Qué hicieron? Llegaron, se ocupan el Estado y dicen, bueno, esto ahora es mío. Yo vengo al, al UPF, ¿sabe qué? Me gusta cómo se ve todo esto, esto es mío. Ustedes son profesores, pueden seguir siendo profesores. Yo no te estoy quitando eso, pero el edificio y la universidad ahora es mío. Y vengo con dos o tres esclavos que son míos también para ayudarte. ¿Qué pasa? En ese tiempo se termina la esclavitud. Entonces los lo afroamericanos le hace falta trabajo, le hace falta cómo vivir, pero tienen coraje contra el dueño, o sea, el que era el que tenía los esclavos. Y dicen, al final, nosotros queremos más dinero, más derecho, porque, porque ustedes me deben. Yo era esclavo tuyo, coño, y ustedes me deben. Sin embargo, los mexicanos seguían luchando en la finca porque eran su finca, eran su tierra. Entonces, las primeras manifestaciones en los Estados Unidos contra los, los mexicanos y los hispanos eran los afroamericanos contra ellos diciendo, ustedes no están robando el trabajo, porque los que, tenía, que, los que tenían esclavos ya no querían más darle trabajo a los negros, sino le mantengan con los hispanos y le pagan menos. Entonces, ahora tú llegas al Toledo, repito y te digo, en ese barrio 
es un barrio de bandas de, de, de latinos, de hispanos. No es fácil que un afroamericano hace una manifestación en ese barrio. Pero entonces cuando lo hicieron, cuando lo hicieron en, a frente a los ayuntamientos o diferentes lugares, como quiera, no participaron de la misma manera. No hay manifestaciones de Black Lives Matter donde no hay latino. Y te digo más, cuando la cosa se puso súper caliente en ciudades como Nueva York, y en Nueva Jersey, y en, en Pensilvania, en Florida, en todos esos lugares, la mayoría de gente que se arrestaron antes, o sea, cuando empezaron las manifestaciones, eran blancos. Cuando, cuando, murió, cuando mataron a George Floyd y empezaron a tener manifestaciones en Seattle, Washington, esas manifestaciones durante meses, no estamos hablando de un fin de semana ni una noche nada más, eran meses en un estado donde sí hay, hay gente africano-americana, hay gente morena en Seattle, pero no hay una cantidad, no hay como en Nueva York. Entonces esa gente eran blanco, pero hay, hay blanco de Nueva York que tiene swing y hay blanco de Seattle que no tiene ni swing ni rumba ni nada, que son blancos. Y esa gente luchaba diciendo Black Lives Matter. ¿Y qué pasó? Los propios gente de la comunidad dijeron, ustedes no son negros, no tienen el derecho de decir que la vida negra importa. Hay una división en los Estados Unidos. ¿Qué pasaron? La policía le echaron eh, el gas de lágrimas. Tear gas. A los a lo que estamos haciendo las manifestaciones, que eran mujeres, madres, abuelas, blancas, con carteles que decía Black Lives Matter, y le echaban gas. Próxima noche, porque todo era toda la noche, siete días a la semana, la próxima día, o sea, la próxima noche, llegaron todos los hombres, todos los maridos, todos los abuelos, con eso de cuando está limpiando las hojas que se, que se caen, like a, la eso. Aire. So, entonces las policías echando gas de lágrimas a las viejas, salieron los viejos a, con, su, con su mierdita para sacar el aire. ¿Qué dijeron? Nosotros como la comunidad negra no necesitamos que los blancos nos representen, nosotros podemos representarnos nosotros mismos. A una división. ¿Ah? Pero si en Seattle, en Seattle no había in front, esos son la gente que vivían ahí, eran ellos. No estamos diciendo que los blanquitos se imponieron a frente de los afroamericanos, no. Ellos hicieron las manifestaciones diciendo Black Lives Matter, no con su propia agenda. Diciendo, mira, ¿sabes qué? Lo que pasó allá en Minnesota está mal. Lo que pasa en Nueva York está mal. Lo que pasa en Chicago está mal. Tiene que respetar a los derechos de todo el mundo. Y, y, y ellos decían, tiene que respetar a todo el mundo, pero ahora mismo, estos son blancos, ahora mismo tenemos que hablar de respeto de la comunidad afroamericana que se lo están matando injusticiamente. Y como quiera, le dijeron, no necesitamos tu apoyo. Pero solo un matiz y es que es distinto los latinos de eh, indígenas del Perú o de México o, o de Sudamérica que los del Caribe que, que sí son afrodescendientes también. Son latinos pero son afrodescendientes, ¿no? No, hay, no se hace esa diferencia. Nosotros ahora mismo en los últimos 10 o 20 años, o sea, siempre ha sido desafortunadamente como medio de racismo una clasificación diferente, ¿no? De latino y sudamericano, lo que sea. Pero ahora en los últimos años se nota más en los Estados Unidos un movimiento de afromexicanos, afroperuanos, afroecuatorianos, eh, eh, reconociendo su, sus raíces africanas y, eh, y compartiendo comida. Por ejemplo, hay muchos memes ahora en, so, en las redes sociales donde... Eh, tú puedes ver un mexicano diciendo mira este es un plato típico de Ecuador o de México eh. entonces un ecuatoriano este es un plato típico de Ecuador un peruano este es un plato típico de, de Perú un nigeriano este es el plato típico de Nigeria y es el mismo plato por ejemplo el arroz con gandules para el puertorriqueño es jollof rice para el nigeriano solamente se cocina un poquito diferente pero es lo el, el mismo entonces se reconocen como latinos y nosotros nos unimos nos unimos 
con eso, porque ya nosotros como latinos ya tenemos ya la experiencia de racismo dentro de nuestra comunidad. El puertorriqueño que es rubio con ojos azules y el que es eh, súper, súper negro y lo que se llama pelo malo en, en, en la comunidad, ¿me entiendes? Ya nosotros pasamos por eso. Ahora el afroamericano, bajo desafortunadamente, hashtags como Black Lives Matter, dice ustedes no son negros, ustedes no son africanos, ustedes no entienden, ustedes no viven como nosotros vivimos. I, uh, thanks. Um, I think it's 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 super interesting to hear about this kind of level of um, this level of experience of Black Lives Matter in the U.S. I mean, obviously it originates there, but it's also a presence here. It's also a presence in the U.K. And I, I, I guess I guess what you're describing is that one of the issues with Black Lives Matter is that it registers with a whole load of different things. So you have like like as you described this kind of African cultural pride, which then they say, well, hey, wait a minute, you're not African. So you can't, you know, there's, there's that kind of level. And then there's, there's like the experience in the UK, and I guess here as well, where it registers with a, a decolonialization discourse, which, which brings it much more into, into areas which, you know, that, that, that we're kind of more comfortable speaking about in Europe, I guess. Um, and, then, and then obviously the kind of main register is, is, with, uh, is with institutional state racism. Right, and, and I, I, I guess that one of the specific things about the, U, the US is just the level of, just the sheer amount of black people that are killed by police. I mean, we, they can't, we can't possibly draw comparisons. And so you have these different kinds of registers with which Black Lives Matter works with these different, with these different registers. And I, I, I guess underlying this, and something that I, I kind of think about quite a lot, is to what extent is it, is it part of a broader movement a broader resistance against state violence and state racism. Um, and I guess my question from what you're saying about this kind of very divisive discourse between Latinos and, and, uh, and, and black people in the United States, I wonder, is there a sense at the same time that we're victims of racism as well, because we're Latinos, you know? Is, is there a sense of people saying that and, and, and finding commonality within this movement? Because, you know, I, I, I totally accept what you're saying, that, you know, the, the racism depends on actually the pigment of your skin. Right, so, but I, I also, presumably, Latinos are, uh, are victims of race, racist policing, institutional racism, you know, carceral, uh, carceral politics and so on in the United States. And I wonder, does it provide that kind of platform for people to know their struggle in common against state racism? In some, oh shit. In, in, como que subieron el volumen, no? In some, in some locations it does. In some, it doesn't. And that's part of the inconsistency of any movement in the United States. Um, when you look at the, the whole concept of Black Lives Matter was in response to this young man being killed. And so everything that they've put into that initial post, we will not continue to be exploited, we're not expendable. That was in direct relation to the murder of another young black leader, right? We, who knows what that child could have grown up to be. You cannot divorce the emotion that that inspires from the movement because the Latino then comes and says, I hear you, mataron a Pepe. Yeah, but it's not about Pepe, it's about Tyrone. Well, shit, I'm trying to tell you that I agree, and I, no, you don't understand, because you're not black. And that's, and that's where we start fighting each other again. And, and again, you look at Latinos, right? You look at the Puerto Rican experience. Uh, I mentioned earlier Albizu Campos, Pedro Albizu Campos, who was the great Puerto Rican revolutionary, uh, and uh, first, first Puerto Rican to graduate Harvard University, became a lawyer, led the National Party, for Puerto Rican independence, when he goes to World War, to the World War, fights for the United States, gets drafted and fights. They put him in an all-black company. He was darker skinned. He was called a nigger before he was called a spick. And he says that in his journal. I was called a nigger before I was called a spick by my brothers in the platoon. When I explain to them that I'm Puerto Rican, all of a sudden the camaraderie changes because I'm not the same. You look at Afro-Cuban religion, 
right? You look at uh, spiritual disciplines that came out of Nigeria, that came out of Ghana, Ghana, that came out of the Congo and found their way into the Caribbean during the transatlantic slave trade. You see Latinos maintaining, Cubanos, what we call Boricuas, which were Africans and, and Tainos and Spaniards all mixed together, continuing the culture. And the African community doesn't necessarily support that. They, they, they just, they say that's different. That's, 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 a, that's a Latino thing, you know? And so Black Lives Matter or that platform had a chance and in some pockets it does unite, but the lines are very, very thin and the platform is very, very weak. The individual I took to Cuba was a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement. He was, uh, again, the movement, not the organization. And we're walking through the streets of La Habana, and he says, I didn't imagine. Para que, tu, para que Manaba me entiende, el tipo dijo, yo nunca imaginaba que habían tanta negro en Cuba. I didn't think there were ever going to be so many black people in Cuba. And I'm like, what book did you read, bro? Because to get from there to here, you had to stop here. Tú no podrías salir de África y llegar a Norte América sin pasar por el Caribe. No, pero es verdad que hay muchos negros aquí, pero no son negros de verdad. So they're not really black. So at that same time, this woman passes by, a very bright yellow dress, very, very, very dark skin, long curly hair, features, again, this was the quintessential hybrid of African with European and indigenous features. I mean, you could see it. The pigment, the hair, the features represented all of these different cultures that made this person very, very dark. I said, what about her? Ella es una morena, es negra. Not really. I will, well, what do you mean not really? If she was in the United States, they would treat her differently. I said, who's they? They would treat her better. Who's they? You know who they is. I turned around and I told him, you mean if she was in the United States, the black community would treat her differently. Not the white community, the black community. So mucho black lives matter, pero como ella es latina, aunque es más negra que, que la oscuridad, tú dices que no es negra, es latina. And you make that distinction. Meanwhile, we're here protecting African religion, African traditions, but we're not black enough. He turned around and said, I never saw it that way, but she's not really black. I said, okay. I said, Charlize Theron, she's African. Yeah, but she's South African, that doesn't count. Okay, so now, now we gotta talk about what part of Africa counts and how dark you have to be before Black Lives Matter. Y repito y te digo, desafortunadamente, tú ves una manifestación de, de los Black Panthers y tú vas a ver Young Lords, tú vas a ver eh, Brown Berets, tú vas a ver cualquier tipo de Latino. Tú ves una manifestación de los Brown Berets, de, de los mexicanos, tú no vas a ver afroamericanos. Sucks. One last question related to this and the previous uh, uh, the previous speech about gangs. Uh, I w uh, there is a question that we have not discussed until now. I think uh, is the uh, the gangs in Spain, Latino gangs in Spain. Uh, there is a invisible divide of race from uh, between the uh, Latino gangs uh, from Ecuador and Latino gangs from Dominican Republic that are Latino, but at the same time, black. Uh, uh, black. Uh, mo most of the members are have some uh, Afri uh, African descent. I don't know, uh, it's a question to you, but also to Maria and to Eduard. If, uh, for instance, I, w I was talking about the divide between Latin Kings and Yetas on one side and um, uh, 
Dominican Don't Play and, and Trinitarios on the other side. Uh, from the point of view of the street life, but also from the point of view of media representation that, in the second case, the racism is, is grow, is grow uh, in my opinion. What do you think? There is a, ra a racial divide. Uh, it's, it, it depends on the American, North American model, or, or, it's, or not? It, it, and I'm curious to hear what else to say, but I'll tell you, it's, that has to do with the American model. It's less to do with the racial divide and more to do with very, very black and white facts. Dominicans don't play as a Dominican gang. Trinitarios is a Dominican-based gang. So, un Dominicano que sea Trinitario, para ello, tiene sentido. I'm Dominican, this Dominican thing, we're Dominican, that's it. An Ecuadorian nieta is a hard pill to swallow because nieta no tenía nada que ver con Ecuador. Tenía que ver con Puerto Rico, con los cárceles de Puerto Rico. It had to do with the prisons of Puerto Rico. But here in Barcelona... And here, now here, they created something else, just like you have Black Panthers that are a gang here, right? So that has to do with normal... If this was the 1920s, then you would have had the Barcelona Saints gang, the Hopitalet gang, the whatever parada del tren gang. And the whole train, you would have had a different gang. But because it's not 1920 and we've gotten these big groups, it's no longer cool to be, uh, what's this train station right here? It, there's no glo Gloria? Gloria. There's no Gloria gang. It's Linea Cuatro or Rojo because it's no longer cool to be a small group. You have to belong to something bigger. The Black Panther component, that, that's just pulling things out of the air because of the American culture and it's a social construct. You look at Ecuador, you look at in Madrid, you look at Barcelona, if I have a problem with Manaba, and somos cuatro gatos, y Manaba tiene cuatro gatos, y vamos a pelear, es bien simple decir, somos nosotros peleando con ellos. Pero si Manaba mañana se decide llamarse, nosotros somos los UPF. Well, shit, now we got to get a name, because he got a name, so now we pick a name, and now we become a gang. And it's less to do with culture and yeah, yeah, yeah. Tra or trans gang. Ahora todo el mundo tiene camiseta. Yo no tengo camiseta. Aparentemente, yo no. Tú tampoco tienes camiseta, así que somos. We're our own gang. She, so, she, has, she has, but. Has. See, that's oh, you're on the cover, viste? Infiltrator. On the <laughs> so, uh, so, it's not so much culture. I think we put more thought into it. You got to understand, uh, you know, uh, the history of DDP, the history of the Trinitarios. It comes from Santo Domingo, but it flourishes in New York under, again, political construct. Puerto Ricans are American citizens, United States citizens, by force. We didn't ask for citizenship. We, we have it, but if we live on Puerto Rico, on the island of Puerto Rico, we cannot vote for the president. We can get drafted from, for every war, and we have, but we cannot vote. You have to move to the mainland to vote. But there is this concept of superiority that comes from we have citizenship and you don't. And that has to do with we were treated like shit by fulano. So tenemos que buscar a alguien que trata como mienda porque a mí me trataron como mienda ahí y yo voy a tratar a alguien como mienda hoy porque no es justo que solamente me tratan a mí como mienda. And so it, it's, it, it became this very... Uh, the Puerto Rican could not understand what is a first-generation immigrant because we, we were not. We immigrated, but we didn't go through at asylum. We didn't go through residency. We didn't go through any of those struggles. We came to, you know, to New York or Chicago. Maybe we left poor or whatnot, but we just got on a plane and got off the plane. We didn't have to smuggle ourselves into this country. So that experience creates a divide. Then you have the Salvadorian, the Ecuadorian, que ha vivido guerra en su país, 
un chamaquito de nueve años que ha vivido guerra, que ha limpiado cuerpo y, y cadáveres de, 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 de la calle, hablando con un puertorriqueño que va a decir, creo que mi bisabuelo cortó caña en la montaña, but that's about it, I don't eso de guerra yo no te entiendo. So, but I'm going to tell you what to do, porque el americano, el que tiene ciudadanía, el que tiene los papeles, soy yo. So it becomes a divide. So they look for little pockets. DDP and los trinitarios were abused at some point by Latin kings, which is why they flourished in New York, because the Latin kings didn't take them, didn't treat them right. We see MS-13s in New York. We see them. Let me tell you, I remember meetings 20 years ago. I remember there was a meeting in Brooklyn donde vinieron 15 mexicanos. Dicieron, bueno, nosotros queremos ser Latin King. Y eran, ¿sabes? Empezando en el proceso. Durante la discusión, alguien habló de un problema que había en otro barrio. Salieron los mexicanos. ¡Lo matamos! ¡Y lo costamos! Y todo el mundo, ¿pero qué carajo te pasa a ti? Y ellos, nosotros estamos acostumbrados de guerra en la calle. En mi país se matan, se pican y se muerden. Es normal para nosotros. Si tenemos que matar, matamos. Pero usted está hablando de, 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 de mediación de conflicto. Usted está hablando de, de conversar. Nosotros no somos de conversar. Somos de que ahí está el problema. Resolvemos. ¿Qué dijo los reyes? Ustedes son unos jíbaros de la montaña. Ustedes no saben nada. Usted, usted es la ciudad. Usted no sabe vivir aquí. Y les faltaron respeto. Los 15 se fueron y se formaron otra banda. So there's a lot of that. And we put too much thought into the mechanics behind it. And I often say this, and no disrespect to any European, pero es el español preguntando al sudamericano o al caribeño, pero ¿por qué te sientes así? Por los padres tuyos, puñetas, porque ustedes vinieron a mi país a joderme la vida. Por eso hablamos español. Porque ustedes vinieron a hablar acá, a, 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 a terminar con nosotros. ¿Cómo tú me vas a preguntar ahora cómo me siento? No es justo. And that's how it is. That's how we look at it. Cuando yo que conocí por la primera vez hace 15 años atrás, usted me explicó la situación de Cataluña. Y que yo digo, coño, entonces hay un montón de ustedes. Y tú me dijiste, bueno, claro, misión, es Cataluña, los catalanes entienden esto. Y yo, pero no son dos o tres gatos. No, es Cataluña. Y yo, ah, pero entonces, ¿por qué entonces ustedes no pueden enter, entender cómo sentimos nosotros los puertorriqueños? los cubanos, que los españoles vinieron a nuestro país a terminar con nuestra cultura, idiomas, tradiciones y enforzar a nosotros a pelear por ellos. We don't get it. It's, it's a cultural thing. So, we look at the kids here in a gang and we want to know why. Why are you in a gang? Why are you angry? Why are you fighting? But we don't let that kid say, why did you come to my country? Why'd you fuck up my economy? Why'd you take away my land? Why'd you take away my culture? Maybe if you didn't, I wouldn't have to come here. Eso pasó mucho en septiembre 11 en Nueva York. Ah, que si la, los torres, que si el avión. There's another country that lives that shit every day. And a lot of people said if the United States stops bothering other countries, maybe other countries will stop bothering the United States. So we have to always go to the root. So the, the short answer is, the, the, <laughs> short, the short answer is that there's, there's a lot of cultural uh, components that it's theirs. Dominicans claim ownership. It's theirs. El cuatoriano tiene que decir, yo soy Latin King desde Chicago, desde Ecuador, y eso nació en Nueva York, pero también en Chicago, pero yo nunca he ido a los Estados Unidos, pero como quiera son un rey latino. El dominicano, yo soy dominicano. Punto y final. There is even another more complex issue that the, uh, the hybridization between this uh, Latino black uh, gang, uh, gangs like uh, Black uh, Panthers, and African uh, boys here in Spain that, uh, that uh, reach or Black Panthers or uh, Bloods too. There are in Madrid and in, in, in Alicante and Zaragoza yeah. some Bloods that are mixing Dominican bla uh, black uh, uh, people or uh, Latino black people and African, sub -sub 
sub-Saharan Africans. But it, there is. Um, but it's all social and cultural, less organizational. The the answer is not found in the Bloods or the Crips or the Kings or the Nietas, because those organizations have nothing to do with that. That's like if two students fight. What? Ah, es que fulano de UPF se, se fajó con fulano de, de University of Madrid. Vamos a hablar con los presidentes de la universidad. Eso no tiene nada que ver. Eso no tiene nada que ver. Please, do. There is an issue with, uh, that is curious and we have found in, in Madrid at least, and it's the identification, cultural identification, of even Spanish boys that are mainly Spanish boys in, in, the, in, the, in the sense of identification, that are from Spanish families. I mean, they, they have not been born here from migrant families, but they are Spanish, like, like I am. And they identify with get, when, when one gang or another and they take the cultural components. Differences, for example, with the kings, you know, the, the reference is the states. Mm -hmm. Okay, it can be Chicago, it can be New York, it can be both. Okay? But the identification is like with that origin, even though Latin kings arrived to Spain through Ecuadorian members. When you observe groups like DDPs or Trinitarios, you see that people entering that gang take, adopt like Dominican accent, uh, Dominican ways, uh, Dominic the Dominican flag, the colors. I mean, they identify group mm -hmm. and country. Even, I mean, even people from the north of Africa, for example, they, all, all guys who enter that two gangs automatically become, even Ecuadorians, <laughs> get an aesthetics like looks like i mean the 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 ori the, the um, idea of that guys is that you cannot differentiate who's dominican really dominican and who is not because they have hair sa the, the same hairstyle uh the ones that are from the north of africa even have a similar skin color so the, the identification from one place is very national, like Dominican Republic, and the other one is more with the ideal of the nation. So that's the difference I, I, I have observed here, and it's curious in that sense. But at the same time, that's an intellectual observation. Eso como alguien con, con capacidad mental mirando a eso y decidiendo, coño, ¿por qué hacen eso? Cuando al final puede ser Yo pertenezco a este grupo y las reglas son estas. Y más nada, no es que yo me identifico como dominicano. Es que yo decidí ser parte de este grupo porque en mi barrio son 20 de ellos y o que son, o, o I'm with them o I'm against them. So decidí ser parte de ellos y me dijeron, tú tienes que ser A, B y C. And I didn't think about it. I just did it. So, so you're looking at it from, a, from an intellectual perspective of the why. Let's go deeper. Sometimes there's no deeper. Sometimes it's just, you join that crew, and that crew said, this is the haircut you're gonna get, and you start to realize, oh, I wanna be identified with this group. So if everybody in my group has that accent, when I'm out and about, oye, tigre, pero tú lo que es, que lo que hay, oye, mani, pero tú lo sabes, tigre, because I want you to identify me as part of them. What I mean, what Carlos was saying, that there is that difference between that groups from the, that came to Spain from the South America than the group, from the groups that came to Spain from the Caribbean. Uh, that there is that there, difference. There's a difference. That's something that I've only seen here. But I saw it in the Kings too. Ecuadorians wearing the Puerto Rican flag, saying that the Puerto Rican flag had to be honored. I remember going into houses of Kings who were from Ecuador that had the Puerto Rican flag hanging or they had a tattoo of the Puerto Rican flag because they read somewhere that they had to. They didn't identify with that. That's not something we see in the States, but I, I don't think it's as intellectual as y'all are making it sound. I think it's more organizational. I joined them. Like it's not, you know, me casé con una ecuatoriana, ella le gusta el ceviche, 
So I learned how to make it. I don't identify with the culture. I, that's what my wife wants to eat. So I, I make it. And the gangs are no different. You see what I'm saying? It, it could be. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that it could be. But I think that we really want to look at who is accepting who. If I am Dominican and I am not accepted by one group, but I am accepted by another, I'm going to go there. If I'm from Africa and this group doesn't accept me and that group doesn't accept me, but this group does, then I'm going to do whatever I need to do to please this group because they accepted me. You know what I'm saying? And, and we see it everywhere. You know, American culture, Burger King, McDonald's, KFC, Cropa uh, Ancha, El Estilo de Vestil, La Musica. I, I always get a kick out of coming to other countries and I see people, you know, singing the songs in English and they don't speak English. And they be like, no, chiqui 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 chiqui. ¿Qué carajo dijiste tú? Yo no sé, pero suena brutal. You don't know what you, no, you don't know what you're saying. But they won't do the same to support their local artists or their local designers or their local styles. People always want something different. So, you know, people want what they don't have. And the reality is, as a human nature, eh, I want that accent. Yo no lo tengo, so voy a practicar para tenerlo. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought this example in Madrid was um, was really, really interesting. This idea that that, that you you have kind of um, one group creates this kind of gang culture, and then another group comes, uh, uh, kind of other other processes of immigration then reproduce the, the national identity of a previous generation of gangsters. I, I think that's the same in I don't know a great deal about this context, but it's the same in London. So in London kind of gang culture tend it originated, or a particular form of it originated with, with Jamaican immigrants, and so they speak Patois, they have a whole kind of system of signification. Nowadays, because of, of, of roots of migration, these gangs are still predominantly, have black members, but they're people whose parents are from sub-Saharan Africa, but nevertheless continue to reproduce this kind of like Patois, Jamaican Patois influence kinds of music, and, and various kinds of cultural symbology that, that draws on Jamaicanness. And I think, you know, we, we look, we're, we're looking at the question of kind of transnationality, but I think another way to think about this is through the, the, the question of diaspora and how, how diasporas form and then kind of reproduce within national contexts, which mean that they're no longer embedded within, you know, say, Pakistani diaspora in Manchester is a specific community. It's not, they're, 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 it's, it's not just Pakistani people. It has its own internal culture, it has its, and it re reproduces within its own kind of terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one way to kind of think about perhaps this, this issue, is to kind of think away from the transnationality and mobility of it all, and to think about it as a completely located within Madrid. That it is, you know, this particular version of Ecuadorian-ness that exists in Madrid, that therefore people from uh, North Africa can kind of reproduce, whereas they couldn't reproduce Ecuadorian-ness in Ecuador, right? So like, it, it's, uh, it's a really interesting example. I, I think it, it tells us a lot about that, that question of transnationality. I mean, there is a literature on diasporas and anthropology, um, with people like Nina Glickschiller, people like that. It could be a good way to think about these, this kind of really difficult relationship between movement and transnationality mm -hmm. and then kind of super locatedness. It's located in the everyday struggle and the everyday community relationships and so on. So it's, it's a really, really interesting example. And, the, and we look at, again, the, 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 a, another example of understanding the answer goes beyond the question. When you're looking at Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Ecuadorians, there's a, there's a sense and a, a cultural identity, at least from a Latino perspective, where tú naciste aquí, entonces tú eres puertorriqueño. Tú no naciste en Puerto Rico, tú no eres puertorriqueño. Tú podrías ser New Yorkian, pero tú no podrías ser Boricua porque tú no naciste en la isla. O tú naciste en la isla, pero saliste de la isla, ya tú no eres puertorriqueño. Ya tú eres una venda patria, vende patria. And that's something that I don't know if the African culture sees it that way. In, in my travels to Africa, I've never met anybody who looked at immigration in that light. You left, you came back, it is what it is. India, you left, you came back, you, it is what it is. Puerto Rico, you left, hmm, hmm. And so you then see them trying to feverishly hold on and prove. It's, it's, it's who an Iceland, it's an Iceland. Maybe it's, a, it's 
insular identity. It happens in New York too. You move out of New York, you can't. It, it's it, it's I like. Too. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the, the other boroughs aren't. So you move out of Brooklyn, and and it and it becomes a question of you're not from here anymore. And they're constantly trying to prove, I am who I am. You know, I remember uh, in my job, uh, I, w I walked in one day and, and one of my colleagues says, hey, tu eres puertorriqueño? And I'm like, yeah. Donde naciste? And I'm like, New York. Ah, tu no eres puertorriqueño, tu eres New Yorican. So my na so I was like, whatever. Because I don't need them to validate me. But over time, I taught that person about Puerto Rican history that they didn't know. I used slang words that only existed in Puerto Rico because even though I wasn't born there, I lived a long time there. I studied everything there. So that was where I was, that, that's my ethnicity. You know, that's like the person who, who has a child in Spain, and the mother is Ecuadorian, and the father is Ecuadorian, the child is Ecuadorian, but the child is Spanish. And, and now we get into the politics of citizenship versus ethnicity. All that gets washed away in the gang and becomes a whole other complex, you know? They want, to, they want to belong. They want to belong. And we have to look at, at the pride in the city. When I first came to, remember I was, I was in Genoa, and there was a football game, and we came out of uh, a meeting of Latin kings and nietas uh, talking about police brutality and how they couldn't even wear baggy clothes because the police would stop them. And some, I guess the wrong team won, and a fight broke out in the bar. Y la gente tirando mesa, y puño, y patá, y botella. Y la policía riéndose. Y arrestaron a nadie, porque todo mundo era italiano. So it, it's, you know, if you live in that area, then you're going to be overly proud. So, that's that. There is a recent book called In America. In America, it's a mixing of Sp Spain and America by um, an Argentinian journalist, Martin Caparros. That's all. Pues sí. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, I think it was also a very interesting idea, just thinking myself, that this idea that um, the tra transnational identity in a way gives power to the belonging in the sense that it's not, like my group is not only my group here in this neighborhood, but in different uh, locations, etc. but then the concreteness of a locality, culture, and culture symbology, as uh, Adam said, gives also the power, no? It's, it's something very concrete. It's like a source of elements that you can use to create a really strong identity, no? In this also very transnational world in the end. Also, it's not transnational. It's Exactly. It's a paradox. They have these transnational identities, but then they are much more limited in the same. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for to all of you. Um, thanks for participating, and we kindly invite you um, to our uh, seminar tomorrow. This will be at the same time at three o'clock local time, Barcelona on Latin Queens, um, Presence, Agency, and History of um, Latin Queens. This uh, presented by our um, Transgang local researcher in Madrid, uh, Maria Olive, and also William Ross. Again, they will share this uh, presentation. And this will be not via streaming, but um, like a video, video, um, how do you say, video? Hmm? Video call? Video. Yes, video call. So. Um, we, we invite you to participate, also register, and uh, see, you, see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thank